What's up, student life? We're going to do something just a little bit different this week. We are going to enter into a time of worship through song, and so there'll be a song that'll play in just a couple of minutes, and uh, and then we're going to get into our Bible study for tonight. So let's worship together uh, through song as uh, we praise our God and Savior. I sought the Lord And He answered me And delivered me From every fear And those who look on Him Are radiant Never be ashamed Never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard me and saved me from my enemy, the Son of God. Surrounds his sin. Deliver them. He will deliver 
All right, go ahead and grab your Bible or your phone or whatever you use for your reference of Scripture. We're going to be looking at uh, a chapter and a half tonight, and I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's very detailed and it's very lengthy, but uh, we are going to be continuing through our studies of the the different offerings that uh, are talked about in the book of Leviticus. We've looked at the burnt offering, the grain offering, and the fellowship offering so far. All three of those offerings were completely voluntary, meaning that nobody had to do them, but they would do them as a sign of adoration and appreciation towards God. There are two offerings that we are going to be discussing next. Uh, to, we're going to look at tonight's and the next week's. These are mandatory, meaning that these are things that they had to do. These are offerings that had to take place, and they had to take place exactly as they were commanded in the pages of Scripture. Sin is a big deal to God. Uh, all throughout Scripture, throughout the Old Testament, we see example of example of how seriously God takes sin. He talks about His hatred of sin consistently throughout the Psalms. And as we work through these different offerings specifically, we see how much detail God goes into to make our relationship right with him. We sin and you sin and I sin and we know that we sin. But our sin doesn't stop with just the ones that we know about. This particular sin offering deals with the sin that mankind commits that we are completely ignorant of. The ones that we have no idea that we committed. The, ones that the, the actions that we do that result in sin, even though we didn't understand that they would result in sin at that time. Moses and God spend almost triple the amount of words to describe the sin offering as they do the previous three offerings uh, that, that have already been talked about. Meaning that this is a big deal to God and this is a big deal to Moses. So what all is communicated in this chapter and a half here uh, in Leviticus 4 and into Leviticus 5? Look at Leviticus 4 1. We're going to, or 4 2. We're going to reference a, a couple different verses through this. Uh, then the Lord spoke to Moses in verse 2. He says, Tell the Israelites, when someone sins unintentionally against any of the Lord's commands and does anything prohibited by them, it is possible. To commit sin and not know that we are committing sin. Look, let's just look at the terminology here. There's two words that I want to focus on, on here. The first one is when. When someone sins. There is not a if there. The word is when. This means that it will happen. It happened to them and it happens to you and it happens to me. It happens to everybody. We sin and we sin and we know it. But not only that, the second word that I want to focus in on is unintentionally. That we sin unintentionally. That you sin without even knowing it. You sin without even meaning to because there's nothing that you can do about it. So even if we thought that we were perfect, and hopefully we don't, but if we think that we're perfect, unintentionally we are still sinning. Even though we don't see it, even though we don't call it sin, it's still there. And everybody from every walk of life has these sorts of sins that they have to contend with. So, so what do they do? And he stresses all the different people that have these sorts of sins. And let me just make modern parallels here. The priest had sin that they didn't know about. Pastors have sins that they don't know about. Entire nations or entities have sins. And, and he talks about this in 13 through 21. Israel as a country, as a people group, had sins. Churches have unintentional sins. Our student group has unintentional sins that we don't know about. Leaders have unintentional sins. There, there are sins within our student leaders, the, the ones that are looked up to. There are sins within our leaders, our, our adult leaders. They have sins that are unintentional. Individuals, meaning everybody, our entire student group, is plagued with unintentional sin. I have unknown sin that I need to repent from. Our youth group has sins that they don't know about that they need to repent from. Our leaders in our youth group have sins that they need to repent from that they don't know about. Each individual student in our student ministry has sins that they need to repent from that they don't know about. 
And so in chapter 5, Moses gives us specific examples of these types of sins that are committed un, unintentionally, un, unknowingly to, uh, to each other. And the first one is in verse 1. And it's the sin of not standing up for what is right or the sin of being silent. Think about this for a second. When there is sin in our youth group, and rather it be blatant or unblatant, whether it be that you are a participant or just an observer, when there is sin in our youth group and it's not brought up and it's not dealt with, you become guilty by just simply observing it and doing nothing according to Moses. And then you must offer the sin offering to, to cover that sin. We don't think about that way in our student groups and in our church as a whole. That we are guilty by observing sin and saying nothing. We're not participating in the sin, but Moses tells us when we see sin and do nothing about it, when we don't speak up to what is correct and what is right, then we are just as guilty as those who are participating in the sin. He also says in verses 2 and 3 that touching an unclean animal or an unclean person because you may touch an unclean, they may have touched an unclean person and not known that they were unclean. They, they had no idea that they were unclean. And they may never have known that they were unclean unless they just asked them outright if there was something that made them unclean. They had an unknown sin. And so they had to repent of that. There are things that you do that you don't even recognize as sin because culture says that it's okay. Maybe your mom and dad say that it's okay. Your teachers say that it's okay. And we're just conditioned to think that this is okay. In reality, it is very much sin, and we need to repent from it, whether we know that it's sin or not. And then the third one is when we give a thoughtless promise. The word here that Moses uses, if someone swears rashly to do what is good or evil. The word rashly here carries with it the idea of not thinking things all the way through or being overcommitted or not understanding exactly what it is that we are getting ourselves into. And as students, you have a tremendous amount of pressure on you, an unfair amount of pressure that is put on you, and it's very easy for you to do this. And sometimes we just have to step back and say, you know what, I can't handle all of this. And when we get into something and it's more difficult than what we assumed and we, have to, and, we, and we can't follow through on what we said we were going to follow through, then we have to offer up the sin offering. So what is it exactly that we do when we've committed these sins? What does this sin offering look like? Verse 5 of chapter 5 says this. Two, two different things that we have to do if we've committed this sin. And what's so strange is that it's the same thing in the New Testament. Verse 5 of chapter 5 says, If someone incurs guilt in one of these cases, an unintentional, unknowing sin, he must bring, uh, one of these cases, he is to confess he has committed that sin. So here's the first step, okay? We've, let's, let's just assume for a second that we've committed one of these sins. I know you have, I have. Here's what we do. We confess that sin. So we see sin in our student group and we do nothing about it. We say, we confess to God and say, God, I messed up. There was sin. I didn't stand up for what is right and I should have and I am confessing that sin to you, right? We, we confess our sin to God. This is, this is the same idea in the New Testament. It says, whoever will confess your sins and call upon the name of the Lord, they will be forgiven. This is a foreshadowing of what's going to happen hundreds of years later with Christ. The idea of confessing your sins is not a new one. It's been here all along. Now, this is extremely interesting to me, and I'm not going to read everything, but verses 6 through 13 is the remainder of the sin offering, okay? Okay. And they had to bring the correct substance to offer up to God. And I use the word substance because there are certain things that certain people would bring. And the reason that there's so many different things that people could bring was to accommodate 
all economic status. So if you were very, very wealthy, you would bring a certain animal. If you were very, very poor, you would bring things like flour. And there was all sorts of different things in between. Here's why I think that is so important. Everybody, despite economic status, despite social status, doesn't matter who you are, can confess their sins, knowing and unknowing, intentional, unintentional, to God. And they should do that. You should do that. I need to do that. We need to confess our sins to God. But then, secondly, we offer this offering, and it's open to everyone. God makes accommodations for every single person. So they can't use the excuse of, I can't afford, or I can't do this, or I can't do that. That's not an option for them. If they don't offer the sin offering, it's because they choose not to. The same is true for you and for me. Because Christ has done everything for us. He is the great offering that covers all of our sins. It doesn't matter our social or economic. It doesn't matter how wealthy or poor we are. None of that matters because Christ is the offering. The New Testament again tells us that we confess our sins and claim the offering of Christ so that we may be forgiven of that sin. So here's the bottom line. You commit sin that you know about and you commit sin that you don't know about. And those sins have consequences, extreme consequences, as if you knew the uh, sin itself. So here's what you need to do. You need to confess those sins, whether you know them or not, to God. You call out to him and say, God, I know I have fallen short in more ways than I am aware. And then you put your hope and faith in the great offering of Jesus Christ. And you claim the promise that God will be just to forgive you through the blood of Jesus Christ. Hope you guys are doing well. And as always, please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or if you need anything. We'll see you next week.